Uh, I would like to uh, welcome everyone uh, this evening uh, to the John Carter Brown Library. My name is Neil Zafir. I'm the director of the library. And it gives me a uh, very great pleasure to uh, introduce this evening's uh, activity, which is the kickoff, as many of you know, and the keynote lecture for uh, an extremely um, interesting and, and um, interdisciplinary and innovative uh, seminar, ser uh, seminar that uh, our symposium that will be taking place uh, one day only, so get it while you can. <laughs> that would be tomorrow. I hope you don't have other plans. Um, in collaboration, um, uh, in which the, uh, the JCB has collaborated uh, with the Joukowsky Institute um, for um, Archaeology and the Ancient World. Um, and, and, and specifically, uh, Felipe Rojas, who is a professor in the, at the Joukowsky Institute, who has spearheaded um, this um, particular event. Um, we, um, at the JCB, um, have uh, embarked on a, a series of collaborative grants that um, were, are, were entitled, the first call was last year, uh, New, what was it called? New Initiative Collaboration Grant, something to that effect. We get confused about titles around here often. Um, but the idea essentially was to put out to the Brown community, uh, the, uh, undergraduates, graduate students, uh, faculty, postdocs, and other institutional centers, the possibility of joining us for collaborative projects that advance uh, both the mission of this institution, which is to study the history of the Americas from essentially the arrival of Europeans, although before that as well, to the end of the colonial period, uh, where that happens and at which time that happens, uh, circa 1825. But again, as we know, often somewhat later, as I reminded uh, someone uh, very recently, uh, the great state of California, whence I hail, uh, actually joined the union in 1850. Um, even though we have at the library tended to stop collecting materials related to Californian history around 1801. So these are interesting and elastic questions that, um, is, uh, that are part of the larger and broader issue, uh, set of issues that we're trying to um, discuss here at the library. What are the other uh, new initiatives and directions that the library is hoping to interrogate and examine, and this uh, symposium I think fits very well within that, is the relationship uh, of the Americas to the rest of the globe. And um, in the program that uh, Felipe has put together in collaboration with uh, several colleagues from other institutions, um, we can see that something that is near and dear to the history of this institution, which is to say antiquarianism, and, the, uh, and not, not said um, in, a, in a pejorative way, but rather in a way that um, highlights the important connections that exist between institutions like this and the past that they are attempting to create and the ways that they go about doing that, um, and um, other parts of the globe, uh, certainly the Mediterranean, but also other parts of the Americas that were deeply engaged in this kind of um, unearthing of the past. Uh, the materiality of the past is also something that is extremely relevant, uh, not only to the field of archaeology, but increasingly to the historical profession as, as well. So uh, we at the library are thrilled to be able to uh, engage in this, um, this new uh, this new project or new program to encourage these kinds of collaborations um, at the library and across the university, and we look forward to more of those uh, in the future. Um, with that, I'm going to invite um, Felipe to uh, come up and introduce um, our evening speaker, and uh, I will, will, but before I do, just briefly, I will say how personally delighted I also am to have Peter Miller here um, with us, um, who is uh, someone who I, whose work I have admired for quite some time, but whom I only had the chance to meet uh, last year. Um, and we also, uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here and look forward to further collaborations and um, speaking engagements in the future. So with that, Felipe. Thank you. So I, I am Felipe Rojas and I want to welcome all of you to our symposium. 
Um, I'll keep my introduction very brief, uh, but I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who has made this possible. So on behalf of Ben Anderson, with whom I co-organized this, uh, and myself, I want to thank Neil uh, and the staff of the JCB, especially Brenda Santiago. Um, and, um, and I also uh, want to have, thank my, my two home departments and the various uh, past and present directors, so Sue Alcock, Peter Van Dommelen, uh, and John Steele. Uh, at the Joukowsky, Jessica Porter, who is back there, did the lion's share of administrative and logistical work. And, and it, is, it is, I have to admit that without her help, this would have been a disaster. Um, <laughs> From, from the beginning, uh, Ben and I wanted to incite dialogue between different scholars who would not usually have the opportunity to meet. So we have lined up um, uh, a number of, of specialists in the so-called new world and old world, some experts on antiquity, other experts on more recent periods, some scholars working primarily on texts, and others working primarily on things. Um, so what is this conference about? Collection and comparison are at the heart of many antiquarian endeavors. The great European cabinets of coins, for example, made it possible to visualize vast stretches of time and space at a glance, and thus to make sequences and juxtapositions of material culture that transform the way people wrote history. Comparison, however, has not been until recently a favorite strategy of investigation for people interested in the history of antiquarianism. Some of the reasons for this are, are easy to pinpoint. Uh, a second order investigation of this sort uh, seems rash, given that in many cases very little work has been done on the various antiquarian traditions in their own historical context. Um, but um, on the other hand, comparison can highlight the particulars even of well-known antiquarian traditions, and sometimes throw light on the dynamic and the dynamics of those for which we have limited information. So the possibilities of comparison are, are great, but so too are its perils. Uh, unfortunately, we will begin this symposium with a talk by one of those rare scholars who has not only published extensively on antiquarianism, but actually promoted the comparison of antiquarian traditions. Peter Miller is Dean and Professor of the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. He has published many books and articles on antiquarian and antiqu and antiquarians and antiquarianism, including several uh, on the 17th century polymath and paradigmatic antiquarian, Nicolas Claude Fabri de Perez. Uh, Professor Miller has also edited two books that face the challenge of comparison head on. Uh, these include Antiquarianism and Intellectual Life in Europe and China, and with Alain Schnapp, uh, World Antiquarianism Comparative Perspectives. If anyone can answer the question, what might a history of antiquarianism look like, it is Peter Miller. So please join me in welcoming him tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you to Neil. Uh, to Felipe, to Ben for the invitation, and also to all of you for coming, giving up, uh, or at least postponing your cocktail hour. I have to say, in 1992, when I first started down this road, I would not have imagined <coughs> that uh, a talk about antiquarianism would be a favorite Friday evening activity <laughs> anywhere uh, in the world. So let me um, begin with a very simple seeming question, and that is, what is an antiquarian. What is an antiquarian? Is it this, the artists and architects who measured Roman ruins mostly uh, with an eye towards understanding and reproducing them? Think of Donatello and Brunelleschi working off the frustration of losing the competition for the baptistry doors to Ghiberti and going to Rome to behave like this, though this painting was done about 100 years later. Is it? Um, is this it? The universal scholars, whether trained as philologists or lawyers or doctors or theologians who used artifacts to find their way into the crevices of the past that had not been described in books or to make sense of still impenetrable words. Is it this? The collectors and bibliophiles and dealers 
who in their monomania have saved, studied, and passed along a great deal of learning over the years? Is it this, <clears throat> the modern scholars who have found new ways, unconventional ways, to bring seriousness to parts of the human experience, material parts which historians have long ignored? Or is it even this, I couldn't resist a local hero, artists and writers of our own day who pay attention to the relationship of discrete pieces of material evidence uh, to the wider world that they are a part of. So I've, I've intentionally sprawled across different axes that may not uh, normally get juxtaposed, chronologically, early modern to modern, antiquarians who thought of themselves as antiquarians and those who didn't, uh, antiquarianism strictly defined as a study of antiquities and antiquarianism as a broad uh, attachment to studying material remains. And perhaps even more complicatedly, antiquarianism as scholarship and antiquarianism as art. Thucydides used archaeology to refer to the oldest legends and physical remains. And it's from him, perhaps, that Plato took the word and put it in the mouth of the sophist Hippias, who describes its content as, and I quote, the genealogy of heroes and of great men about the origin of cities and how they were founded in the earliest times, and in general about everything that has to do with knowledge of the past, archaeologia. The Roman Marcus Terentius Varro, a contemporary of Cicero, translated archaeology as antiquitatis and used it to describe Roman religion and law, calendars, government, and taxonomized in terms of people, places, things, and times. From the Renaissance onwards, antiquitatis was used, but re-taxonomized in terms of public, private, sacred, and military antiquities. In early modern times, historians wrote ancient history by rewriting ancient historians, while the antiquarians made new knowledge by doing research. And um, what I mean by research is exploration, discovery, something new, driven, I think, by curiosity, and um, struggle with new objects that come out of the ground unexplained or with texts that have words in them that didn't make sense. This is just some rough and ready uh, culling that I did from an online version of part of the Peresk corpus. If we think about what we do as research, then I would argue that it's the antiquarians who are really our ancestors. And I say this knowing full well that for a long time antiquarian has been, as we were warned already by Neil, uh, a term of abuse. I'm just going to put it out there. We're going to move away from that uh, very quickly. Though I would note that being called an antiquarian back in, let's say, the 17th or 18th century uh, had the same resonance to it that being called an academic uh, does today. Uh, which is something that we'll uh, think about some more. Antiquarian, as another way of saying researcher, also has the effect of turning historian into another way of saying writer. I think this is pretty plausible, um, with a lot of interesting implications, which I'm not going to talk about, but I'm planting the seed for the Q&A later. There's something else about the antiquarian, uh, and that is that he always works on the very edge of melancholy. Part of it, I think, has to do with encountering the past always broken, uh, always dealing with what remains, what's partial, uh, and confronted always with the problem of time, time the destroyer. But opening the, let's call it the scientific self, to the play of emotions like loss and longing, and I've always been amazed by Nietzsche's choice of the word Zensucht, or longing, to describe the satisfaction that is fulfilled by archaeology. So that, that word uh, and this access to feeling is something that most of us Fachhistoriker, professionally trained, university-based historians, don't generally think about. Um, but it's something that I think needs to be thought about if we want to understand not only antiquarianism, but also to think about uh, how it could function in a kind of comparative context. Um, right. So thinking about these two sides, the study of objects as historical evidence and the emotional access provided by the objects, 
brings me to the way Michael Shanks describes antiquarianism as the study of the past in the present or the study of what remains. Uh, he gives the example of the footprint, something which is in our world. In fact, it's something that remains but is a marker of something that's no longer there. But saying, as he does, that antiquarianism is about the past and the present, what he's trying to do is attack from a different direction the idea that um, history and its objectivity is about something that happened and is no longer happening. And to make the point that the antiquarian relates to the past as something that has an ongoing, ongoing existence, which I think connects uh, directly to the emotional side, because if it does have an ongoing existence, then we can experience it here. Now, um, even to engage in this level of meta-narrative about antiquarianism is, I think, relatively novel. Uh, it certainly was the case that um, in 1950, when Arnaldo Mobiliano published his famous essay on ancient history and the antiquarian in the Journal of the Warburg and Courtauld Institutes, uh, there would have been no meta-narrative for him to deal with. He even made the point that there was no narrative to deal with. Uh, the book uh, which he, he wished he could refer to to save himself all the trouble, A History of Antiquarianism, he says, did not exist. Uh, and the one that he puts forward as sort of the next best thing was actually a discussion of the history of antiquarianism in the context of a handbook of archaeology published in 1880. We'll come back to that um, in a moment. Um, in the last decade or so, there has been a, I would almost say a near flood, uh, compared to what was before anyway, of publications on antiquarianism. Uh, Joe Connors had online a few years ago a bibliography that he prepared of publications on antiquarianism, which ran to about 700 titles. I don't think it's online any longer. Uh, he mentioned to me a while back that he planned to update it and, um, and make it live again. But that suggests something of um, a kind of boomlet or turn in what I like to think of as the history of the history of history. Uh, and we should be aware of that. Um, if we do want to follow Shanks and the idea that uh, our understanding of antiquarianism will, in some sense, be related to our understanding uh, of how we are approaching antiquarianism, then I think we should say a little bit about um, this question of how we're going to understand uh, what antiquaries did. And here, I think, the wider turn in the history of, um, of scholarship and of knowledge to practices in the last decade or so, decade or two, uh, is very uh, helpful uh, because it gives us some way of looking at these scholars and trying without uh, presupposing certain kinds of categories to get some purchase on what they did. So um, they read. Um, to that extent, they re resemble philologists. And there is a, a very close and not easily teased apart relationship between antiquarianism and philology in the early modern period. Um, but they also held stuff in their hands, though for this there really were uh, no theoretical models they could pull off the shelf uh, and use. And so we find often in the 16th and 17th century, scholars trying to come up with some um, second order rationale for what they're doing. So the Roman antiquary Lelio Pasqualini in about 1606 writes to Peresque that there is, I'm quoting, a big difference between learning something from reading and seeing the thing itself. And Claude Somez, a few years later, also writing to Peresque, says that the majority of our learned men, having worked in only one of these parts, are content with what they can learn from books, which is not at all worth what the things themselves teach us once we look at them, handle them, and hold them in our hands. So if we think about what they were doing, we can pick out some rough and ready principles they collected. Collecting is part of it. Once they had the objects, they uh, very intensively described them. Uh, we tend to think in terms of visual description, but I, I have found myself quite a bit of um, very high level verbal description, so the kind of technologies of ekphrasis that were available to these scholars, really quite impressive. I, I uh, remember with pleasure the two pages which Peresque devoted to describing slugs copulating on a branch. Um, 
And that's a kind of art, not just of describing, but also of looking, right? Because you had to look to see what you could write, a little bit like uh, Francis Ponge's poem on mollusks. And finally, um, this activity of describing uh, and collecting was geared towards comparing, because that was the way knowledge could be produced. And the purpose of comparing was geared to reconstructing. So reconstruction is an important element of this. And finally, just to put out another principle, uh, it was a collaborative project, discussion back and forth. And I don't think it's a tautology to say that the Republic of the Antiquaries was Europe's Republic of Letters. Other members as well and other things discussed, but antiquarianism and the Republic of Letters are very closely bound together. Now, as I was saying before, I think starting from practice has many advantages. Uh, most of all, it helps us avoid generalizing. Um, and uh, generalizing is always dangerous, but especially, uh, especially perilous if what we want to generalize is something that stretches across a comparison. Um, Comparative history is relatively under-theorized, and I think that would be something we could talk about. I'm glad that um, it's already come up in the introductory uh, mentions. I think it's something that often uh, we are uncomfortable with because the degree of certitude that one can have in a comparison is often much less than the control one can demonstrate with a carefully bounded subject. There are always things in any comparison that won't fit. But it's important, I think, to, to just remind ourselves that um, you know, in the classic treatment of comparison, Max Weber in the Agrarian Sociology of Ancient Civilizations, he, he tells us quite, quite outright that comparison is not about discovering similarity. It's about really perceiving difference. Right? It's about splitting. And to that extent, we don't have to match everything up. What we're looking to do is to find a way of seeing from a different perspective. So just to give a, a quick uh, example from a project which I, I did mention before, comparing uh, early modern European and Chinese antiquarianism, um, the, there was much in common, but what emerged as different was very interesting, and that is um, to see that it's the Europeans who developed this much more um, autonomous focus on visual and material culture versus a more uh, epigraphic tendency in Chinese antiquarianism, but equally that the emotional dimension of the study of artifacts was much more present front and center in the Chinese antiquarian tradition than in, uh, in the European one. So I was, I was chuffed when a Chinese historian uh, wrote to me and said that Peresque was a typical late Ming intellectual. <laughs> and of course, that's right, uh, but I wouldn't have thought that otherwise. Uh, and here's another example. Um, Lothar von Falkenhausen makes the point that uh, the study uh, in the Sung period of uh, artifacts and careful observation was linked to a Confucian imperative to investigate things in the world as a way of demonstrating and practicing virtue. We can then turn directly to somebody like Mabillon and the Benedictines of the 17th century and understand the way in which antiquarianism could have, in fact, a theological or a sacred dimension, and then look at other people who were not theologians, Peresque and his friends, and understand that the intensity of their commitment to the scholarship is a form of secularization of this uh, devotional dimension. So these are things that one can see by looking from uh, a distance. And I would add one final point, which I think is actually uh, present in both cultures, and that is the relationship of antiquarianism to um, a more extensive culture of empiricism. Uh, Momigliano made the point in the Seder lectures comparing Peresque and Galileo, and I think it's true if you look at uh, Northern Song antiquarianism and natural history as well. There is something about this focus on looking and describing intently that um, is a kind of epistemological premise, which then uh, is found in issues forth uh, in different places. So then the question, um, Momigliano 
1950 tries to talk about what happened to antiquarianism and his, his view, I mean, he's, he is indirectly trying to deal with this question of the pejorative, only an antiquary, a mere antiquarian. Um, and his, his rehabilitation effort was uh, a somewhat partial one in that he gave the antiquaries the credit of developing research tools which were then taken by Edward Gibbon in his account and imported into um, modern history writing, giving the antiquaries the credit for the historical method, but at the same time ushering them off the stage in the middle of the 18th century. Um, so what would happen to our vision of the history, of the history of history, uh, if we could show, or if it turned out to be the case, that antiquarianism didn't just go away, didn't just go away. So maybe a word picture. If we imagine, which is true, that all of us are sapiens, we're all homo sapiens, and remember that there used to be other hominins of our same genus. There was Homo rudolfensis in East Africa, Homo erectus in East Asia, Homo neanderthalensis in Northern Europe, Homo florensiensis in Indonesia, Homo denisova in Siberia. Of course, they're all gone, and so we elide their existence and make the assumption that sapiens are the only members of this genus. And similarly, I think that um, we think most of us do, maybe not the people in this room, but outside, that history is the university-based discipline of history because all the other kinds of historical scholarship are gone. There was a kind of triumph in the 19th century uh, in the university that left no space for antiquarianism, there are no departments of antiquarianism in any university that I know of. Um, but before that moment, there was an antiquarian practice which communicated with the practice of university-based historians. We might even say they interbred to pursue the analogy. So this parallel of human history and history's history is really just a kind of mindfuck it, to get your attention. Because what I really want to talk about is something even more dramatic. I want you to close your eyes and imagine that those other human species I mentioned are still alive all around us. Because okay? what I'd like us to think about is to think about history's history and retell it in such a way, and I'm going to do it in about 20 minutes, in such a way that we can see those other species of historical scholarship remaining alive. And not on some distant Pacific island, as if, but in our own intellectual space. Maybe even some of us in this room have as much of that antiquarian DNA in our scholarly genome as we have of the university-based discipline of history. Now, Momigliano long ago, casually, tossed off this point about the way the decay products of antiquarianism in the 19th century um, are the disciplines of the human sciences. We could call them genera, archaeology, anthropology, art history, sociology, history of religion. If we think about that, we have really a whole new history of our family, uh, used in the technical sense, the family of the human sciences, where the antiquarian genome is passed along and is present in these other, uh, other genera. But if we want to focus on our particular genus, we'll call it the past-loving creatures, we can see that there are additional species belonging to the past-loving genus. These might include the museum curator. They might include the conceptual artist. I'm thinking of Mark Dion. They might include some long-form fiction writers, Hilary Mantel. And they would include the whole large clan of the public humanities. This word picture that I've been drawing here, I think, gives uh, access to a different way of thinking about history and its uh, 
its neighbors, but also a different way of thinking about the future. And we'll come back to that at the end. It also means, more narrowly, that the phenomenon of antiquarianism around the world seems much less problematic. Uh, maybe, in fact, it's actually the late-born, late-arriving, university-credentializing, scientific dimension of this relationship to past loving, which is actually the thing to puzzle over, rather than the presence of antiquarian practice all over the world. So let me try, in, in the short time that's left, uh, first I was given 50 minutes, then it was cut to 45, and then Neil said 43. Uh, so I'm making no promises. Um, but let's start a little bit and see where we, we get. Renaissance antiquarianism will begin there, a very clear instance of the study of the material past on its own and in conjunction with texts in the ways that I described. Um, we can see it in the 17th century already developing in the direction of um, sources from the non-classical world, both from the Near East and increasingly medieval Europe, and the beginning of, uh, we might call them technologies, diplomatics, epigraphy, paleography, genealogy, uh, and sigillography. What we see developing as these scholars tackle new kinds of materials, <coughs> that hadn't been studied before, is we see them developing ways of asking questions that will pry open these materials to give answers. We might think of this uh, as a kind of evidentiary imagination, how to turn you know, this into evidence for something. I've written a lot about Peresque, but somebody like uh, Jacob Spahn from Lyon, at the end of the 17th century, says, for me, I say that books are not more history than medals or inscriptions, and that it's not the one or the other, but the pieces from which it's drawn. And he gives uh, eight different categories, uh, branches of what he calls archaeographia, a science that's focused on material remains. Mabillon is really the first uh, historian of the book, the first person to attack the text as a material artifact, uh, studying the papers, the inks, pens, the seal, script, binding, the whole package. Uh, Leibniz, contemporary of Mabillon, uh, moving in the same direction when he writes the history of, of Brunswick, addressing all of these kinds of sources, um, but also thinking about their relationship. And he has this fantastic analogy. He writes, just as the bones support the whole, the nerves make the connection between them, the spirits and the humors give direction, the juice nourishes, and the flesh binds the whole together. In historical studies, chronology does the work of the bones, genealogy that of the nerves, the secret motives, the spirits, useful examples, the juice, and the detail of circumstances, the mass of flesh. Without the sources, there's no evidence, and without evidence, there can be no truthful account. And Leibniz is himself a tremendous uh, defender of antiquarian scholarship, precisely because he sees himself as the heir of their work on evidence. Surveying his achievements in the 20th century, Henri Baer and Lucien Febvre praise him um, and write that with him, the conception of the written text as the sole source of historical knowledge first appears as a relic of the past. So they see Leibniz really as the beginning of a uh, historical practice in which <coughs> material evidence speaks as loudly as textual evidence. By the time we get to the middle of the 18th century in Germany, Leibniz's practice, which itself remains a kind of idiosyncratic one, uh, not yet systematized, not so dissimilar, in fact, from his uh, earlier 17th century forebears. By the middle of the 18th century, we do begin to see a systematization. It happens at the University of Göttingen, which is a new university. It's associated with the name of Johann Christoph Gotter, who sets up a historical institute there, founded around 1764, and sets up a course on what he calls the Historische Hilfswissenschaften, the, his, the helping servile sciences of history. Auxiliary is how we put it in English and in French, uh, a little more modest. And the idea is he will teach students how to crack open these particular types of sources, the same ones we've talked about, genealogy, chronology, geography, uh, epigraphy, diplomatics, numismatics, et cetera. 
he will, uh, and he did, publish textbooks in all of these subjects, which he compelled his students to buy, uh, and then uh, revise them continually, so they had to always buy new ones. This was not his own practice, but a common one uh, at the time. Professors, I guess, never really earned a lot of money. Uh, students were forced to take these as the preliminary courses in their training as scholars. And of course, the one thing that we all know about required courses is that students hate them. Uh, and that was the case then, too. So Goddard pours actually very interesting ideas into these books, um, such as um, uh, he's very clear that, uh, and develops a whole logic of what he calls historizieren, how you treat historically certain kinds of material evidence. Uh, and he makes the point that um, evidence in itself works by virtue of how it fires the imagination. So he's very clear the reason why we do all this tedious work on particular kinds of evidence is that it actually enables us to write more interesting books because it gives us real things to write about with which to engage our readers. So he connects, uh, and it's an important connection which, which I think perdures, this kind of very intense scholarship on, um, on the sources with the idea of writing accessible kinds of books. Erudition and imagination uh, working together. And this kind of awareness of the reader, if one steps back just a moment, is, I think, uh, representative of the period of the end of the 18th century, much wider reading public, increasingly uh, feminine readership as well as male, and interest in historical literature that Mark Phillips talks about as para-historical. No, not necessarily books of history, but novels, memoirs, um, different kinds of short fiction, all of which can be anchored um, in history. Sir Walter Scott would be an obvious example, and which satisfied a kind of interest by those past loving creatures of which we are. One of Gotthard's contemporaries uh, at Göttingen, uh, August Ludwig von Schlotzer, develops this idea in a slightly different direction. He takes the idea of material and links it very directly to a new focus on the nation. This is the age of the French Revolution, on the nation as the subject of history. And so things uh, that affect the nation, um, such as um, battles, but also folk history, agriculture, social life, all of those things are um, subjects for history. A materialized history is what he envisioned his new field of statistic to consist in. Now, when Alain Schnapp talks about archaeology in his classic argument as evolving out of antiquarianism through the advent of two new, what we might think of as tools, one being excavation and the other being stratigraphy, he's thinking in terms of practices. But we can also look into the, the training literature, the textbooks that were produced at universities like Göttingen, and see the emergence of the concept of archaeology out of philology, because archaeology was taught in the philology faculty because, uh, like good antiquarians, the objects needed to be understood if the texts were to be understood. And we have the beginning of a literature which was called, right from the 17, early 1770s onwards, Archaeologie der Kunst, Art Archaeology, Archaeology of Art. And if we read through the, the textbook literature from the 1770s to the 1870s, we find the, the ambivalence of this category. And it's an ambivalence with consequences that runs right up to the present. Is art archaeology to be the study of all artifacts or only the aesthetically pleasing ones? They understand that the past can be conjured from all artifacts and sometimes only from unattractive ones. Yet nevertheless, they are drawn, the people who write these books, they are drawn to the more um, aesthetically pleasing ones. And here we have the ongoing division, if one wants to call it, between the way historians and art historians look at uh, illustrations and objects in their work, the differences between archaeology and art historians, between material culture and historians, all of this, these hover around the question of how compendious is the category of the material artifact to be studied. And this ambivalence uh, can be traced all through this literature, and no one, uh, no one resolves it. 
where there is perhaps the most profound reflection on this is in fact in philology textbooks where, um, where the idea of studying the philology of things, Sachphilologie or Realphilologie, is one of the main principles. There's a debate that actually turns on the question uh, of Kant uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, but it, what happens as well, the idea of the, the need to have recourse to the material is because there is in the philology uh, faculties this idea uh, starts with Heine, runs through uh, Wolf on to Beck, that the goal of the philologist is to explain the entirety of the world of the past. And that means that even complicated and obscure artifacts need to be explained. That, um, that idea of reconstruction, which is implied in the total goal, in turn creates, again, a need to explain how reconstruction is possible, which leads Schelling, Beck himself, and Beck's nephew called Bernhard Stark, all to reflect on the role of the imagination in scholarship, that this task of reconstruction cannot be done by the scholar without um, this kind of talent. What Stark writes in 1873, what philologist could make sense of an ancient poem without, and I quote, instinctive tact, vitality of reenactment, and a creative supplementing, right? There's a kind of fantasy that's required. And so the first professor uh, of archaeology at Cambridge, John Marsden, talked about the close connection between the antiquary and the poet. Beck himself writes a, a detailed public economy of Athens, published in 1817, which examines mines, houses, slaves, cereals, cattle, wine, oil, salt, wood, dining, clothes, shoes, and weapons. Uh, and then it moves on to matters of finance. Uh, and then in his uh, Corpus of Greek Inscriptions, published first in 1825, the material that he deals with is divided up in the classic antiquarian way into public, private, ritual, symbolic, and then um, his own category, learned antiquities. The tradition of handbooks on archaeology include um, detailed description of all of these uh, techniques, like in Carl Ottfried Müller's handbook, uh, techniques of making things, how furniture is made, the way utensils work, and then it moves on to the artifacts. What happens in the beginning of the 19th century is that the subordinate role of the Hilfswissenschaft and the study of the material culture as probative to determine dates, names, etc., moves out of the kind of the basement, the prerequisites of the faculty, um, and becomes the actual sources for writing German history. But it happens outside of the university. So in the era of the Napoleonic Wars, the uh, study of the German past becomes important. There is, uh, because of questions of survival, very little of the ancient period. What gets worked on is medieval. The medieval materials were precisely the content of the Historische Wissenschaften. And so you, we begin to have in the various historical associations, which are founded really from the 1810s onward, uh, in terms of number, uh, a Hessian bureaucrat in 1846 estimated 60 historical and archaeological associations with about 9,000 members, and a bibliography of a scholarship published by these amateur historical associations in 1845 was 654 pages long with titles on every page. So a huge amount of scholarship. And it's there, I think, that we find this kind of fascinating mix of art history, archaeology, philology, geography, uh, and folklore outside of the university uh, by these amateurs. German antiquities, they borrow the term antiquities, antiquitates, uh, they borrow the categories, objects of daily life, et cetera, but they apply it to medieval and modern times. And it's a very awkward thing. Many of the writers comment on it. Uh, they look at prehistoric, post-classical, but always studied uh, in terms of the last of the classical. Altertumskunde works for them for the German Middle Ages as it would work for the study of Greece and Rome. They use the antiquarian indiscriminately with historical, uh, with Altertumskunde, Altertumswissenschaft. It's the, the, the language blurs these differences 
it's an awkward application, but of course for us, what we are seeing really in Statue Naskendi is the attempt to describe what a kind of modern scholarship that links together material and textual sources uh, would look like. Uh, by the time we get to the later 1830s and 1840s, many of the scholars in the associations are calling this mashup of sources and mashup of subjects, daily life structures of existence, etc. They're calling it Kulturgeschichte. They're calling it cultural history, which has, uh, which functions as an overview. Um, many of the the people who then turn to write these cultural histories aim it at a popular audience, and we can see the beginning of uh, the tradition of. Zittengeschichte that runs into the 20th century. Those of you who are familiar with Walter Benjamin's essay on Edward Fuchs as a collector would know that he published himself many of these histories of morals, histories of customs for a popular audience. That's the direction that this goes. But there is also the more serious side embodied by uh, a, a forgotten scholar named Gustav Friedrich Klemm from Dresden, who's a librarian, writes about the history of porcelain. Then he writes a uh, history of collecting in Germany. And then he goes off, travels, comes back, writes uh, a 10 volume uh, general cultural history uh, where the focus is on all of the material dimensions of existence, uh, physical conditions, clothing, living quarters, domestic furnishings, means of locomotion, industrial activity, family life, social life, games, funerals, public life. I'm gonna lose my time if I keep reading this, but you get the, you get the impression that this is a kind of uh, panoptic approach that focuses on living, living conditions, and material existence. And this is done in a kind of systematic way, uh, an evolutionary way, this is the 1840s, uh, from the peoples he describes as most simple or primitive to the more sophisticated. And it's roughly a kind of chronological one leading up to his own time. But the most interesting thing about this 10 volumes occurs at the end of it where there is an appendix which is he describes a fantasy of a museum of cultural history. And uh, it so happens he himself was a collector uh, who organized his material in terms of tools and weapons, jewelry, clothing, uh, vessels, dwellings and furniture, writing materials and writing, coins, weights and measures, vehicles, musical instruments, sacred arts um, from all over the globe. And what he, uh, what he does is he imagines a museum in which the artifacts would tell the story uh, of their identity. And in fact, we then, uh, this is a reflection on his own collection, but it's also the way in which he wrote this book, these books. Having done that, he then decided to, to take the chronological approach, the diachronic approach, and turn it on its axis and treat the same material synchronically in a two-volume work, um, which he calls uh, general Kulturwissenschaft. He invents the term cultural science, Kulturwissenschaft, which then has this great heyday later with A.B. Warburg, as a way of, he explains, um, the material foundations of human life with the representation of bodily needs, the means of their satisfaction, and the products arising from them. It represents human relations within the family and their broadening into the state. And then in the final part of this, uh, deals with the results of human exploration and experience and also spiritual creations uh, manifested in science and art. So Kulturwissenschaft runs the gamut, but it's constructed as a material narrative. Uh, and since I don't have the time, I won't go into the interesting question of uh, thinking about Kulturwissenschaft in the context of Karl Marx and Marx's critique of German philosophy. Think, read the German ideology alongside of any a passage like that in Clem or others, you'll see that what Marx is doing is something very similar to what Clem and others are doing in terms of thinking about society's organization in very, very material terms. Obviously, Marx has a polemical uh, angle that uh, Clem does not. So Clem represents one way of developing cultural history, material studies. Uh, Hans von und zu Aufsess, Bavarian aristocrat, represents another. He has this idea of, which emerges out of the historical association movement, of telling Germany's history from the Middle Ages to 1848, not in a book, but in a museum. And he is the person who eventually in 1853 uh, founds the Germanisches Nationalmuseum in Nuremberg, which is really the, the first cultural history museum, where all of these objects are arranged thematically, uh, daily life, dwelling, women, cooking, uh, in order to 
give access to a German history through the material remains was um, widely hated by the professoriate. There's a, uh, a review uh, of the museum and the learned journal that was published, the Zeitschrift for Deutsche Kulturgeschichte, the, the journal for German cultural history, was reviewed, I guess, like the Middle States Association. Um, uh, Ranka and Droysen and Grimm, and they hated it. They panned it. They didn't like the idea of the fact that this was done by people who were non-habilitated scholars, uh, archivists, librarians, gymnasium teachers, and of course that it dealt with little things, Kleinigkeiten, uh, not grand narrative, but obviously um, human scale. Alfsess himself was a kind of graphomaniac, and he has fantastic charts that he publishes, and um, a kind of modernizer in terms of scientific organization. He has the um, museum publish a series of memoranda where they, uh, where I guess it's he, obsessively documents every thought that he had about how the collection should be divided, which is wonderful for us because we see that in fact, not only does he describe it as antiquarian and as altertumskunde, but he divides it in the same fourfold way of public, private, military, and sacred. So these ideas live on even into the world of the modern museum. In 1860, Actually, 1859, the first number of the Historische Zeitschrift, the, the American Historical Review of Germany, uh, is devoted uh, to uh, praising the current state of German historical scholarship. That's the first article, which makes a point of attacking antiquarianism. And then, uh, as if that weren't clear enough, the second article is devoted to attacking the Germanisches Nationalmuseum and the kind of history that's produced there. So it's very clear that there is a, already by that point a certain defensiveness that has set in. In the next year, uh, Jakob Burkhardt's Culture of the Renaissance in Italy is published. It receives a glowing review in the Historische Zeitschrift, and we can sort of see already the path that moves to the future, since in most histories of cultural history, uh, the beginning is with Burkhardt's publication of the still mistranslated culture of the Renaissance uh, in Italy. What's very interesting, though, uh, is that if we stop the story there in 1860, it would look as if the evolutionary narrative was correct, uh, that antiquarianism forced out of university, condemned, that uh, like the Neanderthals in the current imagination, they went off into some cave in Spain uh, and all died. Uh, and, uh, but it didn't actually happen that way. There was a kind of pause, but already in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, the key figure is Karl Lamprecht, who was, uh, I think, the most important historian for the 20th century. He was, in his own day, the promoter of Henri Piren. He was the teacher of A.B. Warburg at Bonn in the 1880s, founded an institute for universal and cultural history at Leipzig in 1911, which hosted Marc Bloch, who was a devoted reader of Lamprecht's long into his uh, too short uh, life, uh, and also Johann Heutzinger, uh, who devoted his inaugural address at Groningen to the debate about Karl Lamprecht and his historical scholarship. Lamprecht publishes his Habilitationsschrift on the material culture of the Rhineland in the Middle Ages. It's uh, a fantastic book of scholarship, appallingly written, with no scene setting, no introductory material, and yet, um, German Economic Life in the Middle Ages, subtitle, Investigations into the Development of the Material Culture of the Low Countries on the Basis of Sources Principally from the Moselle Lands. And what Lamprecht does is economic history as cultural history. Reams of statistics attacking the problem of economic life um, from different angles, but what he's interested in, um, and I'm quoting him now, in investigating the development of the material culture of the Low Countries in their totality from the legal and economic sides, out of the conviction that the specific ideal circle of beliefs of man can be much better grasped in the total development of culture through the spheres of specific real or material culture, of econom economy and law, rather than on the contrary, only of art and science. So we have here already the continuation into, I think, almost a, a modern form of the approach, uh, the comparative, integrative approach uh, of looking at material culture as a way of grounding an assessment, a total assessment of a past civilization. 
From Lamprecht, I think we go right into the 20th century, as I said, to Heutzinger and, uh, and to Bloch and even to, to Warburg, though Warburg strains at the university system. But otherwise, um, I think the, the mature academic monograph of our own past century, which we're all familiar with, and its tendency to synchronic structure, preference for the analytical over the storytelling, often narrow focus and narrow address, emphasis on evidence. I don't think it's unfair to see it as the product, really, of the antiquarian researcher, to use uh, the term, the binary launched by Gotter, more the antiquarian researcher than the historian writer. At the same time, just to go back and tie up the sort of phenomenological approach, Nietzsche talking about longing in Zenzucht or de Chirico, um, the role of the arts as a place where these issues are discussed makes a lot of sense if we start from the presumption that the engagement with, um, with material remains is, as Shanks talks about, something which lives on into our present and affects us as people, then it's not surprising that as one forum for this kind of discussion closes, and I'm thinking of the university-based discipline of history, it's not so surprising that other fora emerge to deal with a basic need of people to reflect on their own existence in time. And we could, we could um, run through, I'll just throw out some names we can discuss later, Piranesi, the Ave Barthélemy, Walter Scott I mentioned, Victor Hugo and historical novels, Balzac is a key figure who actually devotes a great deal of attention to archaeology, not only of Paris fast disappearing before his eyes, but also the metaphor of archaeology as a way of thinking about the uh, psychological lives of his many, many characters. Um, Melville and the way in which he narrates cytology and the material culture of whaling. Uh, Phelps Stokes and his iconography of lost New York, experiencing its centenary. Um, Walter Benjamin, whom we looked at, the Passagenwerk really is a piece of 20th century antiquarianism. Uh, David Macaulay's uh, architectural drawings, um, Zebald and his photography, Mark Dian and his installation, all of these are in fact representatives of uh, the way in which the past loving uh, species that we are uh, works in all sorts of different ways. So having come to the end, um, we tend to think of, and I'll, I'll just use Hayden White as an easy example, when Hayden White wants to make a point about what history is, he reaches for Gibbon, Ranka, Macaulay, Guizot, um, um, Tocqueville, um, Burkhardt, as the canonical exemplary history. 1760, 1860. I think what we may actually see is that they are not canonical, but exceptional. That the varieties of, of past loving, the varieties of ways of doing historical scholarship far exceed the kind of once upon a time, happily ever after that Walter Benjamin takes uh, as his target uh, in his rebellion. And so I think in this kind of Copernican revolution, if we can call it that, where the dominant account of history becomes the exceptional one, once we realize that there were, and in fact remain, many species of past-loving scholarship, uh, past-loving practice, I think we university-based historians may uh, understand better our own place in this landscape. There are other species uh, out there. And as a result, we may be able in the future to collaborate better with our siblings across a species barrier that should not feel so insurmountable. Thank you very much. I owe each of you four minutes <laughs> to be collected at some point.
gave your list of literary references at the end, you left out poetry. And I was struck by three poems, Ode on Richard, Osmandus, and even The Raven, whose title character perches on a bus of Palace Athena. And I'm sure there are dozens of other uh, examples. But as I say, it migrated out of the academy and really sort of captured the popular imagination in, in so many ways. I think that's, that's the case. Um, I have liked um, and found very useful uh, rereading Stephen Bann's uh, Clothing of Cleo, which is an older book, but still a wonderful treatment of the way in which um, history, uh, I don't want to say trickles down, filters into, moves into, non-scholarly spaces that were accessible to a much wider public, different kinds of illustration, for instance, or theater, uh, or certain kinds of painting. And I think it's absolutely, absolutely right. And Mark Phillips, in, uh, in the work I mentioned earlier, Society and Sentiment, really focuses on the late 17th and 18th century in England as the beginning of this opening up. I think it's absolutely right. In terms of poets, indeed, uh, I didn't mean for my list to be uh, comprehensive by any stretch. Uh, I would say, though, about the, the Keats, uh, I, had, I did write at the end of Paris Europe about uh, Hegel's treatment of the phenomenology of right of antiquarianism. And in fact, uh, I, make, I illustrate it by a discussion of that poem. I think it's absolutely right. There, it, is, it does speak, though, in a certain negative way, because Keats's point is that the antiquarian venture cannot succeed, but right? we can never get back to those silent veils of Arcadia. Um, I'm interested in your sort of earlier point of branching off in some ways, the account that you did, where the past-loving um, creature becomes primarily concerned with totality, which is explicitly that there's a shift in some ways from singularities to totalities, and the persistence then of the object-loving uh, creature as a uh, also related species, or perhaps genus in this case, um, to the ones that you were discussing here, wherein the pastness, precisely as in Shanks's uh, term that you use, in the present, the presence of pastness in the present, remains an important part of the charm of objects, but they're not um, means to get to a past totality, they don't have to be cracked open or supplemented, they're somehow sufficient to the exchange um, in their singularity. And that too, you could tell a story that um, would perhaps then lead from somebody like Jacques Alvarez, for example, from somebody who's interested in the peculiar powers of individual objects that could also take you through now Balzac, but a different of the sorts of objects that exert you know, strange ancient objects on these you know, foreign places that have a peculiar power of the people in the present. And that would bring us maybe into psychoanalysis and maybe also to similar people. Um, I mean, is that a crucial distinction, or are we really talking, I mean, this point is, a, I guess, a, a, a trite taxonomical point, but how does the object-loving person who's also interested in the past relate to the past-loving person who's also interested in the past? So, um, I think this actually connects, in some sense, with the, question, the first question, right, about the popular dimension here. And you could actually um, run the story I told kind of backwards, which is how I do it in the book from which, which that was a kind of sprinted version. Um, you know, in a way, um, we live now in a period of time that really makes this point about the, the object serving as the past and the present and the way in which they seem to have a kind of occult power over many masses, everybody, right? Um, and I think that is, <clears throat> that's, um, that's part of the special feature, which is complicated to really grasp, but part of the special feature that the material has. Uh, it extends, of course, to the, the book as a material artifact. Right? It's something about, about this kind of constitutive nature that it does have this ability to speak, whether it's because of Nietzsche fingering that longing, a kind of nostos for something. Uh, Benjamin talking about childhood as the divining rod of melancholy. There are lots of ways in which one can, um, can take this. Um, 
I mean, you know, I hate to do it because it seems such, like such a cop out, but Winkelmann is a great example uh, to think about this with because he's what's famous for writing the big narrative. He himself was trained as an antiquarian, he was a librarian, both before in Dresden and then for Cardinal Albani in Rome. And as soon as he, he gets that giant history of ancient art off his back, what does he do? He goes back to writing about individual artifacts, the Monumenti uh, Antiqui. So in a way, um, there you can kind of see both. And I don't know that uh, it needs to be the case that, um, that uh, past loving has to be only one form or another. Um, I think there are, there are increasingly, to put it in our own time, there are, uh, and presumably was always the case, it certainly was true in 19th century Germany, there were certain stakes involved in adopting one or another of these positions. Someone like Peresk, for example, didn't have to publish. He was an aristocrat. He lived off the family rent. He could spend his time focusing on individual artifacts, communicating them ad hoc with a wide circle. Um, if you have a job, then there might be standards in your profession, in your institution that you have to live up to. And, and in a way, the real evolutionary story is not about the way of studying the past. It's really about the institutions in which the past is studied. And I think that has a tremendous impact uh, on this question, and if we you know, really want to take it to the present um, and think about curators and professors, or curators and professors and artists who work on the past, there are such different expectations of their performance as to really make it difficult to transgress, to adopt, uh, to interbreed, let's say. Hi, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. I'm an anthropologist. I don't study human evolution, but sometimes when I teach an introduction to archaeology, um, I have to <coughs> take students through the maze of different species, um, in genus homo and otherwise. And it strikes me that your use of that metaphor is instructive in a way that maybe you didn't intend. And that's that there are these really intense fights over what, what is a species and what is it, and what is a subspecies and what is it. And many people don't think that homo than the silva is, is a separate species. Um, I think that, that in some ways we already do think about ourselves as separate species. And maybe there's a better metaphor, maybe reclaiming, uh, my question is effectively, can we reclaim Leibniz's organic metaphor for the relationship between uh, past loving types of people uh, as a way to integrate our project, rather than thinking about ourselves as necessarily separate species, which opens up student questions about typology. Well, it, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Uh, I want to start at the beginning, uh, which may be easier to get at than the end. Um, it is, the other thing I didn't mention, but maybe it goes without saying, is that um, there's huge debate about, let's say, relations between Homo sapiens and Neanderthal. And one of the theories is that there was a genocide that was committed by one against the other, the winners, it's us. Um, and of course, we, we know full well that relations between different uh, kinds of past loving peoples are often rather tense. Uh, and communication across departmental divisions uh, are often difficult and strained. Uh, so I think that's another element of this. The, the kind of this speciation right, produces also occasion for establishing one's identity. And, and conflict right, arising uh, as part of that process, almost intentionally as part of the process. Um, and that, like, I guess I would say, diagnostically has been the case. Uh, if one looks at, for instance, uh, in part of the spectrum I spent a lot of time in, relations between art historians and curators, uh, example of uh, a kind of tension which makes no sense, uh, except if one views it through these kinds of institutional evolutionary uh, lenses. Could we get back to the halcyon days of Leibniz? Um, well, I don't actually see how we're going to get from here to there. Um, but I do think that the first step to getting there is acknowledging that there is more than one way of doing history, right? that the university-based discipline is the university-based discipline. It's not history. Uh, 
simply to say it's not the only kind uh, of history. His past life is done in lots of different places. And in fact, if one wants to think about the way in which comparison works, right? Comparison is about looking from somewhere else and seeing what's not in you because you're looking from somewhere else. Well, if one takes that idea and applies it to the different kind of past loving species, there may be lots of things that historians could learn from uh, conceptual artists like Mark Dion, or he from historians, or curators from. You can see how communication across these through comparison would be beneficial altogether. And maybe that's a, a step towards moving back. Whether these, uh, I mean, this is where, of course, the metaphor has to break down because um, it's not a natural condition that we're in. This is an artificial one that we've ourselves made and could be unmade, right? The boundaries are not so hard and fast. And for instance, so much work seems to be done nowadays in uh, different departmental fields uh, through experiential learning where artists will work with, let's say, archaeologists to make vessels in order to understand how historical vessels were made. That already is a step towards the Leibnizian view, right? Um, because making and knowing are cognate. They do help each other in that way. And that, I think there are some of these incipient steps uh, in this direction, but the, you know, there, is, there is the institutional problem that gets in the way. So I think, um, I think it's not impossible to imagine at all, and it's a, it's a kind of noble goal, uh, beautiful to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful talk. And I, um, <coughs> you used the phrase at one point, the birth of the revolution. And I'm wondering your example of, you, you were um, so much of Tourette's. If in the antiquarian pursuit uh, there's so much materiality that it is in any way a threat to other kinds of activities like religion, you, you didn't mention religion much. And I'm wondering if um, in discussing antiquarianism you see it as in any way a um, a threat to another way of thinking about humans on Earth. Right. So let me just make a couple of points. Um, so one would be that um, there's variation over time. So if we take Peres's youth, he was born in 1580. So right around the end of the 1580s, 1590s, there develops in Rome the um, intellectual field of sacred archaeology. The discovery of the catacombs sets off a kind of flurry of scholarship, in fact, driven, interestingly, by the Belgians, who happened to be in Rome, um, uh, going into the catacombs, documenting, drawing the paintings that they see, writing about it. The pub chief publication of the Roma Sotronea, uh, Bozio doesn't come out until much later, he dies young. But there's an example where, at a certain moment in the Counter-Reformation, um, there was a, a, a belief verging on confidence that this kind of material knowledge would support the claims of the universal church. So at that point, there was no perceived conflict. On the other hand, you know, if we go uh, to the rest of the generation and then just beyond, something like Mersin who says, you know, we don't use science to interpret the book of Genesis. The, the empirical disposition of someone like Peresk to study everything as if uh, on an examining table using instrumentation, um, that was already being perceived uh, as problematic, though um, there's, there's often big lags. So the arguments that Spinoza makes in his Tractatus of 1671 are made in spades in the 1630s without causing the crisis that Spinoza provoked. In the 1630s, there was a greater, let's say, suppleness or resilience in, in the debate, so to speak, between religion and um, scientific technique that enabled these critical positions to be absorbed and accommodated, whereas in the 1670s, for various sorts of reasons, that was gone. So I think, in principle, there's no reason why materiality was a conflict uh, zone for religion. 
but again, a lot of it will depend on the, on the context of other features. Giving us many 